this particular breakout session is bridge and ICAPS data, FY23 data, and building for FY24. This was supposed to be Kathy Olson, Tracy, and myself. However, Kathy, because of that season and because this is scheduled the way it is, um, she was at a conference. Somebody is sick at that conference, so she's presenting there instead of here. So we have the lovely Rupa with us in Kathy's place. So that's where these three names all fit in. But Kathy and I built these slides. Rupa's familiar with all of it. So we're just going to jump right into this. Um, if you have questions as we go along, you are welcome to either unmute and shout them out or put them in the chat and we'll go through it that way. I'm fine if you interrupt us as we go through or if you need me to repeat something. Um, while there's several things on this agenda, some of these are pretty short and sweet, but we do want to cover all of these different things in the hour that we have you with us. So FY23 bridge and ICAP survey data. So last spring, uh, we did a a bridge and ICAPS survey and ask, what did you offer? How many students did you have? Um, all those parts and pieces. And so I know there's been times in the past I've done a survey and I'm like, huh, what never happened with that? Just sitting on somebody's desk somewhere or is it just sitting in their email collecting dust? So we wanted to share with you what we'd actually done with that survey and how we were using it and why we are appreciative of everyone's answers on that survey. Um, so SIPDC, so Sarah and Tara and I um, separated out the approved list from the unapproved list for bridges and for ICAPs. Um, SIPDC started reaching out to some of those programs to see what hurdles were to getting approved um, and helping remove some of those hurdles, whether it was they just needed the chat form link, they just didn't understand the chat form. They had no idea that they had these things that they even needed to do an approval process because they had new administrators. So we were, you know, trying to work through. Not everyone has been contacted yet. So don't stress if you haven't heard anything. Um, we are working our way through that list. Uh, but as you all know, we all wear multiple hats. And so time, sometimes that list is front and center and sometimes it falls off the radar and we got to pull it back up and get through some more. But um, we are working our way through those for both bridges and ICAPs on approved and unapproved. Um, we also then went through and we compared the reported numbers um, on that survey, how many students you thought you either had already served or you anticipated serving. Because we did it in the spring, we wanted to capture anything that maybe was going to happen in May or June. Um, and we compared those to DAISY numbers to identify if there were discrepancies and then to reach out to programs and remedy those. So that, that reach out may have come from regional support. It could have come from Sarah Terra. I mean, I, I'm not sure where all those contact pieces came from, um, but we were trying to have everybody kind of look and compare and see where that was and what those numbers look like. Then we took the list of approved bridges and ICAPs, and we added that to the bottom of the main page of ICAPs Illinois website. Um, Tara, if you want to put that in the link, you can't, but it's it's right there. It's pretty easy. It's ICAPs Illinois. Um, the middle button, and I, the screenshot at the bottom is off of the main page. The middle button where it says current ICAPS programs, it actually takes you to two possible lists. One is a bridge ICAPS, one, sorry, one is a approved bridge list that ran in FY23, and the other one is a list of approved ICAPS programs that ran in FY23. And we have those out there. The list we had on that page before, I think was from like 2018, 2019, it really needed updated. <laughs> Um, and the reason we have that list out there is because sometimes we hear from programs, you know, Chad may say, hey, we're looking at building a, you know, we've got our CNA established, but now we're looking at building a TDL, but we don't know where to start. So we can say, take a list, look at this list, see who's already running a TDL that is similar in size, similar in location, similar structure, maybe if you can figure those things out and reach out to that program and say, hey, I'm interested in running a TDL. Can we set up a meeting to talk about what that looks like? So that's really the intention of that list is so you all can have some of those other resources out there. Sarah and Tara and Amy and Brittany and I are happy to share names with you, but sometimes waiting for an email from one of us on days like today, it's not gonna happen today. You're gonna get it tomorrow or Friday, where if you have a list, you can just go look at it right away. So, um, those are some of the things that we did with the survey data from FY23, which is why we needed data from all of our programs so we could have a current 
up-to-date list. So thank you for all of that information that you shared with us. So FY24, Rupa, I believe this is you. Yes, ma'am, it sure is. All right, so in FY24, programs are being monitored early this fiscal year by their designated uh, regional support, mainly focusing on having a bridge and ICAPS. Uh, throughout the year, the regional support team will utilize programmatic data to compare your submitted and authorized request with any ICAPS or bridges that were run during the quarter. Uh, also focusing on the total number of participants enrolled during the quarter. The programmatic reports uh, will be used by ICCB employees to address issues and successes. And of course, if you have any issues or problems, you can always reach out to your region support. I'm pretty sure they're willing to assist you. And this is where I often hear success stories. Different regional support will reach out to me and go, hey, you got to hear mm -hmm. this really cool story I just got on a quarterly report. So again, they are being read and we are talking mm -hmm. about them. So absolutely. Yes, definitely being read for sure. So but I also there are times that Rupa may walk across, walk right next door because she's on the other side of that wall right there. Um, <laughs> and sometimes she'll walk over and be like, so I got this report from this program. Help me understand what they're talking about. So mm -hmm. again, we're looking at them, we're analyzing them, we're checking to make sure what's happening yes. is what's supposed to be happening. All right, sorry, Rupa. No, that's fine. Is this you? No, this is you. Oh, sorry. Yes. So, um, how are bridge students identified in DAISY? That's when we're looking at comparing these and looking at information, that's often a question that we get. And it's either people that aren't familiar with DAISY, it's new people to adult ed, um, whatever, new people into a position, they've been an instructor, but mm -hmm. now they're in an office um, trying to pull data out. And so students are identified by course in DAISY. I talked about this very briefly earlier, similar screen. Um, you go into classes, you build the class code, all that information. Yes, it's a bridge class, select the type, um, is it standalone or is it a series and then the cluster that it fits into? Um, this is a screenshot straight out of DAISY from one of our programs in FY23, so it's there. And you, the course description, and this is going to be similar to what's on your course approval form. Because again, bridge students are identified by courses. The rest of that page, minimum units of instruction, instructional category, you can only choose one of them. And then this information. Michelle, I see you have your hand raised. I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Can you, um, in the previous screen where it said bridge? Yes. Thank you. Um, our um, team always was wondering what is transition course and why do you select no? Okay. So I've asked that exact question of Kathy. And because I wanted, to, again, I programs have asked me, what's, do I need transitions course? Do I not? So the transitions course, according to Kathy, is an outdated piece in DAISY that is no longer used for anything. So your best option on the transitions course is to select no, because even if you select yes, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't change any of your data. It doesn't move anything. So when they do um, some more updates in DAISY, that may be a question that comes out. I'm not sure. I'm not in on all those questions because I, again, as most of you know, I'm not on the adult ed side. I'm on the workforce ed side, but I'm familiar enough with DAISY to get me into trouble. But this question <laughs> is one of those that you can answer no every time. And then FY24, we are working towards, um, you know, um, talking and trying to improve DAISY in a much more accessible and a better format so that, and we are addressing issues that are coming up. So yes, hopefully by FY25, we will be able to address all the issues that you might be, um, you know, dealing with, so yeah. Thank you. Um, can I ask too, uh, when you mark yes for bridge course, uh, mm -hmm. I do know, you know, you put in your career cluster type, but standalone, what are the other options and what should we be checking for bridge course type? What what are you so looking there's, at? There's typically two courses, two, two options. There's a standalone and there's a series. When Bridges first came out, even going back before ICAPS, 
a lot of times programs would have two or three courses in the series to make it the overall bridge that that last third course sometimes was really an ICAPS course, but we didn't have that thing yet. And so a lot of them were series. Most programs currently are running them as a single standalone course. Now, this is a question that is also on the bridge approval JOT form. And so I would say with whatever you put on the JOT form, I would fill in a DAISY. But honestly, most of them are standalone at this point, Michelle. Thank you. Sure. And that is exactly why we're doing the session. So you all can get those questions answered. All right. So we talked about this. Sometimes I have programs that mark all four of these for job for a, a bridge course. Your bridge course is probably not foreign GED. Your bridge course is probably not citizenship because those are different types of courses. It should have job skills related to it. And it may or may not be math only depending on how you're bridge, building your bridge class. But if when I get when I see programs have and again this is on the jot form for the bridge program approval and I see programs that mark all of them I often email them back and go are you sure you're really doing a foreign GED as part of this are you really doing citizenship as part of this and they're like well no okay then just uncheck the box so and it's just cleaner data that way all right so that all was right. bridges I'm oh, sorry Yes. Yes, this is me. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So one of the questions that keep coming up with more adult ed DAISY questions is that how can a program indicate that a student has completed an ICAPS course? So completions of courses indicated on the attendance grid uh, of a particular class uh, for regular attendance grids, uh, the user will record uh, a C, capital C, on the date that the student completed the class. For individualized uh, attendance classes, if the student completes an ICAPS program, that should be noted on the student's status screen. If uh, the individual completes all ICAPS related courses, but isn't flagged as completing ICAPS on the status page, they will not be counted as an ICAPS completion and will not be NRS reportable. Uh, the screenshot below highlights a student who enrolled in and completed an ICAPS program as noted on the status page. Also, in order for students to be NRS reportable, they need to be shown as completed ICAPS. Is the difference between exited and completed? Exited is they left the program for any yes. reason. Mm -hmm. I, they got a job. They got sick. Mm -hmm. They went to jail. We've all had those students, you know, they, that's an exit. The yeah. completion is where they finish the training. Or they might just not think this is a field that they would want to, sure. you know, um, lead on in the future with, so. Sure. So that's the difference between your exited and your completed. Because people have asked that question a lot about what's the difference. Is this still me? Back to me? Yeah, that is you. Okay. Oh, we. I swear we talked about this. Oh, it is me. I apologize. All right. <laughs> All right. Completing an ICAPS. All right. To complete, uh, to mark a student complete an ICAPS, uh, they must have completed the training portion of the ICAPS. So MSG was established to aid programs in counting the work completed while also recognizing that some students may not obtain the credential for a variety of reasons like we spoke earlier. For example, not able to take the test required for credentials in the same fiscal year of services. So that could be a lot of reasons to it, you know, that could impact. Uh, documentation of training completion placed in student files is strongly suggested. And those consist of attendance records, uh, certification of completion, uh, certifications of completion are not industry recognized credentials and Angela can tell you more about the recognized uh, industry recognized credentials maybe in well, our next slide. That is a question that I we've had I mean I've been here three years and that's a question that often comes up does our completion certificate count as a right 
industry credential. And my question is, I'm looking at a name, I'm trying to figure out. Okay, so Patty Mendoza is at Lincoln Land. So Patty's student gets a certificate of completion from Lincoln Land, but then they move to Chicago and apply. She got a certificate of completion in welding. So now they move to Chicago and they try to get a welding job. Is is that employer going to accept Lincoln Land's welding completion certificate? Maybe, maybe not because they're within the state. If they earn an American Welding Society certificate, that employer is 100% going to accept that AWS certificate. The same thing if they move from Lincoln Land to Missouri, Missouri is going to go, I don't know what Lincoln Land is and why do I care if you completed their course or not? But with an AWS certificate, it would be allowed. So mm -hmm. certificates of completion are not industry recognized credentials. They are great certificates. They are, I mean, they are helpful for students to show that they made it all through way through the end, they got the completion, but it's not the industry recognized credential that we need for an ICAPS. Basically the credentials need to be capable of getting an individual a job. So like we have Coursera, you know, that's recognized. We have Google certificates, just, just an example you know, right. that uh, helps them to get a job and people know about them. Right. And additionally, one of the questions that also comes up, like within CNA, is first aid and CPR, are, they're industry recognized. They right. are industry recognized, but having a first aid certificate and a CNA certificate does not get you a CNA job. Because I have first aid CPR. <laughs> you do not want me to be your CNA. And so again, they're building on it possibly, but they're not that end employable certificate. Yes, Michelle. So what would you do in, in the case, I'm going to use CNA, okay. if let's say during the fiscal year, they have passed the CNA course with the CPR uh -huh. and their clinical rotation. However, the state exam um, isn't until September. Now they can still work license pending, but they've not sat for the um, IDPN state search. So as the, that fits into the top bullet on the slide. So this is where those they have completion is ending the training portion. So that exact example. So if they go through their, their um, I just lost the word. When they go in and do their, their what is the word when they go in? Clinicals. When they go and they do their clinicals, they've done their coursework, they've passed the class, they've done everything, that would get them marked as completed because their credential is a different piece. So that is where you would mark them. This is, for example, not able to take the test required for the credential in the same fiscal year. Exactly that. So you may do your finish it in May or June, but they don't test until August or they don't get the scores until August. So that August would be where you plug the credential in, but they actually completed the ICAPS in that previous year. So when, okay, you might've just answered my question. So we would, so I'm just gonna use fiscal 24. Sure. We would put them as completed in June of, yep. and, and that would be a, would that count then as a NRS gain for 24 for our institution, even though the credential won't come until 25? Yes, so on this yes. screen, you could plug them in as exited because exited could be that they completed. Mm -hmm. So they exited in June 15th of 24. They've done everything they need to do except the test. So then you would mark them as complete. They would then get the credit, they would get, they would count on the NRS report as a completed ICAP student for FY24. In August, say you've got them in something or whatever's going on, and in August is when they actually get the credential, you could go back in and add the credential to them but, in August of 24. But it's frozen. We've tried doing that and it won't let us go backwards. Correct, because you may need to, well, in order to plug them in, in as an FY25 student, you would have to have them enrolled in an FY25 class. But what so if they you, weren't? If they weren't, that's where you, yes, that's where you run into issues. But again, that credential individually is not hurting the NRS numbers because, because the NRS that, is based on completion. 
Right. And that particular student has, you know, uh, put in all the hours that were required to finish a course. So we can count that as a completed ICAP student or individual, a participant. So if you have a student then who, um, after they got their their licensure credential, but doesn't come back to adult ed, maybe they passed their, you know, their Illinois high school diploma, yay, while they were in the ICAPs, which is the goal, and they don't come back, do, do we get dinged in any way because we didn't put that credential? I mean, even if they do obtain it, it's just no way to mark it in Daisy if they're no longer in um, our adult ed program. So my understanding from Kathy is that the lack of credential is not a ding. The completion of the ICAPS is yes. a plus. But I will go back and check with her again. No, that is correct. Sure. Is that, that right, Rupert? correct, yes. Okay. Okay, well, what if they were, I'm so sorry for all these questions, but what if they did come back and then, um, you know, they they still hadn't passed the social studies or the science and they mm -hmm. wanted to be with us. And then I find out, uh-oh, they flunked or didn't pass, I'm sorry, I hate that word, didn't pass their nurse ex, nurse assistant exam. Um, it, is, do I just mark, just leave a blank, don't put in the credential? Correct. Okay. Correct. Val, I see your hand is up. Thanks. I, I just, this is my understanding. So I just want to make sure I, that Michelle and I, we're on the same page. My understanding is that you can get a measurable skills industry recognized credential one time per one student per one period of participation. So if they have their high school diploma, then whoop, good, we got it. And And they don't, if they don't get their license, it doesn't hurt us or help us it just doesn't count at all unless like you said the following year we can put them into some kind of a course that is maybe it's a you know a bridge course that helps them with studying for that exam or some kind of a course and then we can get credit for that again not again right. you can only get it once but we really don't get credit if it doesn't happen during the fiscal year um, unless we have some kind of another industry recognized credential or or uh, credential, you know, like really, I think the high school diploma is the main one. Um, so that's my understanding. So it is kind of frustrating because sometimes if you're doing, you know, if you're doing training in the spring, it's sometimes hard, especially like for CNAs to get their license in that same fiscal year. Um, but it, so, I mean, it's something to think about when we're programming. So right. you get credit for everything else except for that credential, unless they got a credential, a different credential. And, and right. that's what I think, but tell me I'm right or wrong on that. <laughs> no, Val, I believe you are correct. Um, and and from my understanding, the credential, we have said that you need to have a credential at the end of the ICAPS just because it's best practice. The student needs to have that industry recognized credential to go get that job. But for NRS specific reporting, the credential is not as important as the completion of the training. They're more good concerned about, oh, sorry, sorry, Angela. No, that's fine. Yeah, I was just going to say good or bad, about, whatever you think yeah. of that. It, I mean, that's, I think, the reality of it. What What about if you, like for us, we have two ICAPs that um, will run from, they start in the spring in January, but mm -hmm. they don't complete till August. So that's still considered um, our summer. Mm -hmm. Our fall doesn't start till like August 17th. Now we've straddled two fiscal years. So the completion would actually be in the next fiscal year because they they earn their certificate of completion, 117, 118 credits yep. in that next fiscal year. So then it'll kind of look like we didn't run an ICAPS that year. We'd have to count the ones from the previous year, correct? Well, what it does, it, my understanding is that um, we would look at, did you have students identified in FY24 as ICAP students? Did your bridge students identified in ICAPs as FY24? Because when we go in and we look at this screen and we see that the start date was April 3rd, we're going to say, well, they may or may not have finished by June 30. They may be an overlap, but you offered that course in FY24, so that counts 
as offering an ICAPS in FY24. Plus your proof is the attendance that right. you are, you know, counting for that particular student. So that kind of, you know, is the proof that you were running, you know, a bridge or ICAPS during that fiscal year. But then we, it's frozen. So we're not going to put that attendance in for like July and August until well, it's the next fiscal year. So we have our teachers keep it on a spreadsheet when it gets unlocked, then we put it in, but it always looks like it's that following fiscal year. And as long as you guys are okay with it, we're okay with it. We just want to make sure we're doing it correctly. And, you know, we can actually get back to you, Michelle, on that one, you know, oh just my gosh, a yes. confirm question, uh, confirm answer. And let me write that down. And where are you from? Which program no, uh, are you so, from? Yes, Joliet Junior College. And I believe I've got my director and manager in the room too. So, okay, uh, yeah. That would be awesome. Thank you. Okay, Shamir, I'm going to come to you. But Mary, I know that you have been unmuted a couple different times. <laughs> I'm watching you. Don't worry, Mary. Do you have something you want to add or ask? Oh, I'm fine now. I, You guys, you're answering questions. It's okay. Fabulous. Wonderful. Okay, Shamir. I was just wondering along similar lines as Michelle, because we had students, a student that completed in summer. And I was wondering, like, hey, what what do we do here? Because she's not with us anymore. Like, she's moving on to something different. So there's, like, no way for me to update her in a new fiscal year because she's not a student anymore. So I was trying to figure out how that worked as well. And I'm still not sure I 100% get it, but I'm trying to get there with what's being said. Okay. Val? Yeah, I would just say there have to be hours in the current fiscal year that they get the credential for you to put it in. You can't go back. You can only do things that, like you did. the only thing that exists in Daisy is the current fiscal year. So when we're designing our program, if they end in July and August, that's okay. Like every year, you just kind of have the beginning of the program and the end of it in the same fiscal year. It's you're going to get credit if you have hours attached to the credential in the fiscal year. So like if you're finishing it up, that's okay. You can show that you started it in the last fiscal year and that you finished it this one. And it, every, you know, everything has to happen in the current fiscal year. Cause same with high school diplomas, it's a frustration. We've lost, we've lost those diplomas to get getting credit for our individual institution if we don't have them come to class in July and they test in July or August. So we have to be thinking about that when we're planning. You know, like Michelle, it sounds like yours are fine because they always do that. So you're you're always going to have the end of the classes and then the current fiscal year that the credential happens. So that's good. You know, it's only when you don't have any kind of class and they're just getting the credential. You really just don't have any way of demonstrating that in Daisy is what I think because that's just of experience that's what I, that's what I think but you guys check me because if I'm wrong that would be awesome but yeah that, I mean that all sounds right good okay can I move on from this are we good and we knew there would be questions about this so do not I I am totally okay with with these questions. Um, okay. All right. So we talked about that one. Yeah. We pretty much covered that. And we covered this one. Yes. This absolutely. is where you plug in the, this is where you plug in that credential. Mm -hmm. And if you don't see yours on the list, the blue line here, the blue text gets you to a form that sends it to me and we go from there. Okay. And this is in the goals and achievement tab. All right, so are all of your bridge classes and ICAP students marked correctly? <laughs> well, following the FY23 survey, we asked programs to double check their data. And what we heard was that some knew how to do that and some did not. So I'm gonna walk through how to do that for both bridge and ICAP students. I'm gonna go through this. I, I mean, I may move fairly quickly just because there's, I mean, it seems kind of obvious to me, but, also know that these slides are on, should have been 
right next to where you joined the link for this breakout room. So you can go back and look at these slides over and over and over and over. These are not top secret. If you want to take them back and share them with your data people, do it. It's totally okay. So how to find a bridge course in DAISY. You go up here to the glasses section and I just clicked on list search and search. And it pulled up the screen. So you come over here and you click yes for bridge course and you click the box in front of it, which makes that check mark come up. These two lines here then are added when you click this green box in front of the bridge course option. You can fill those in if you want. I left them blank when I was doing my search. This is from an actual program and there may be somebody from that program here. Don't worry, I'm not, don't, don't stress about the fact I'm using your data, it's fine. So then I clicked on search. The good news is if I'm using it, then you're probably doing it right. So the results from your list, class list, you have the year, you have the class section number, the course name, the instructor, category, the building number it's in, how many students, you have a roster attendance and a date and delete option. This is normal for all of your classes, but we specifically looked for the bridge classes that were identified as a bridge class. So this is just one class of eight classes within this program. So when you're going in then to look and see who's your students in there, in each, within each class, you would use the roster button over here. You click on that icon and this is what the roster screen looks like. Um, there isn't actually a last name column over here. It just was too wide for my screenshot. I didn't like it, so I cut it off. Um, so we've got a manuals as first name, date started, expected to start, actual start, funding source, exit date. What reason did they exit? They completed. Great. Good for them. And then you can update whatever you need. So then you look at this. This is one student of four that was in this class. So that's when you ask yourself, should there be six students in this class? If there should be six and there's only four listed, who am I missing? But at the same time, if you know there's only supposed to be three in that class and we have four, <laughs> who doesn't belong in this class? Who got plugged into the wrong class along the lines? And those mistakes happen in DAISY. They, I mean, they just do. I was part of a program. Our data person was our front front desk person. So the phone would ring, somebody would walk in the door, sometimes she hit submit, sometimes she didn't. It happens. But that's where you can go back and check your data, check your numbers to see. And this is bridge students. Yes, Michelle. So um, if they're different levels, would they still appear on one roster? Or do you have to go per level? If you have them built as stacked classes, they should all appear in one roster. But if you have a course, let me go back a screen. If you have a course that one is, this is English as a Second Language 3. So if they have a different course that they have built as English as a Second Language 2, you would have, it would be one of these eight. There's, and this was only a screenshot. I didn't grab all eight classes. Um, but if, you, so you may have to look in, click into different classes to make sure you've got all your students. Okay, I just got a, a text, ours are stacked. Thank you. <laughs> sure, yes, if they are, if you have them built as stacked, then they all show up on one roster. All right. Questions on this? Okay. There's something in the chat. Uh, uh... Um, okay, uh, uh, Angela, sorry, can I interrupt if that's okay? Sure. Yeah, just going back to Michelle's question that she had regarding, you know, we start in ICAPS during uh, the fiscal year 2023, uh, and, um, you know, that main course carries on till August of, you know, the new year, when the new year begins, can that be certified or can that be credentialed as uh you know a course an icaps during the fy during fy 23 so uh the answer is which is not a very good answer but the thing is that classes that end in fy 24 on july 1st or icaps that ends in fy 24 uh on july 1st or after 
it, sh it should not be counted as something done in FY23. It will be counted as a course that is reported in FY24. So, so that it wouldn't sense. complete until 24. Yeah. But yeah. it does count as a course run offered yes. in 23 yes. for that yes. grant requirement. Yes. So they can count that as a completed course. They will be getting credentials for it. In 24. In 24. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but so again, the proof will be the attendance that you mark in uh, in day C, you know, to confirm the fact that, yes, you were running ICAPs or bridges during FY23. So that is your proof, but it would be a completed course for FY24. And I'm sorry, it's not a very good answer, but yeah. No, but it's very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. It also depends on which year the midterm falls in. Yes. And which which semester that you are, or which fiscal year you count them would mm -hmm. be the, the fiscal year where the midterm falls. Yes. If you're doing closed enrollment, yes. Yes. Because I was like, midterm? Oh, wait, wait, that's closed enrollment. <laughs> it's... Mary, you keep me on my toes all the time, which is good. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Can so I, that was all. Can I jump in with a follow-up question? Because I do get this from programs as well. If you have run the ICAPS, let's say in 2023, the student completes July 2024, you know, for whatever reason, they took it a week later, they were on vacation, whatever, finished the credential, took the test, whatever it is. If you're not running that same ICAPS in 2024, that credential doesn't count, right? It doesn't count for FY23, but it will be counted for FY24. But if you're not running that ICAPS in FY24, uh -huh. then how yeah, is that counting? You, yeah, then you won't be counted. It, it exactly. Won't be counted. That's, yeah. I think that's part of what that other question wanted the answer to. Because if you are oh, only okay. running the ICAPS in one FY, they don't you know, whatever attendance or they, I, I don't know what the scenario is, but you've got to have it running the fiscal year that they get the credential for it to count, correct? Right. But what, what often happens, and I know there's lots of programs that do this. I mean, there's three of them in the room that have already addressed, spoken to it, is that they'll run an ICAPS in like May, June, July, August, or June, July, August, or across that fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So the first portion of that does count for the running of the ICAPs towards the grant requirement. The remaining portion of that does count as running it in 24, and that's where then you would attach the credential to it. So it it kind of depends. It's almost, we're getting so far into the weeds at this point, it may be better to have individual conversations with regional support to see where exactly that lines out and what that looks like. But yes, that's... We're, we're talking very similar things, but like moving a date here or there does can change and impact those things. Yes. Yeah. So as long as they have some classes still overflowing into the next fiscal year and they get the credential that next fiscal year, as long as there were at least one or two classes is what I'm hearing, then it counts that fiscal year too. You've got to have coursework that year in order for it to count in that year. But uh -huh. if they do, if a program, say Michelle's program or Shamir's program is a June through August program, they're going to get that credit every year. So even if that student, or maybe maybe Michelle's program runs, a, like you said, January through June program, they don't get the credential until August. If they complete it in June, that still counts for that completion in that previous fiscal year. They're going to run another ICAPS, maybe the same one, June, January through June, and get credit in the new fiscal year for that new ICAPS. Okay. Okay. All right. So on to ICAP students, how to find ICAP students in DAISY. So that when you go into DAISY, you've got the basic search, then you've got this advanced search down here. There's a little arrow that you can't really see, but there's a little arrow when you click on the side of that, it turns into this advanced search. This advanced search actually is much longer than this. 
but that's why there's a chunk missing in the middle because I wanted it to make to be able to show it on the screen. So when you click on the status button, you've got these three at the top and then you have these at the bottom. So you're gonna, where it says ICAP student, you're gonna click on the, you gotta, you have to do both. You have to click yes here and you have to click this check mark. Then you click submit, either at the top or the bottom, doesn't matter, submit is what you're after. Then this is what it looks like as a result. You've got these three students listed. There's their date of birth, their status, their test date. So you're looking to see, so Michelle's running her phlebotomy ICAPs and she should have 12 students in there. She has 12 students, great. They're all in there, these names are all right, everything's good. Just like I showed her on a different screen, she's got 15 students in there, she was only supposed to have 12. Which three are in the wrong place? Or the opposite direction, she's supposed to have 12, she only has nine. Oh, which three am I missing? And figure out those students, move them, which is why on the far side over here, which I didn't get a copy of, there is a delete button because you can delete them out of the class if they don't need to be in that class. So that is where you track down and your regional support are gonna be tracking down. You know, when, when Rupa's coming for a monitoring visit, she calls up, I don't even know if Rupa's with Ginger, but she calls up Ginger and says, hey, we're gonna do a bot monitoring visit next week. And Rupa goes in to see if Ginger has run any ICAPs, has any ICAP students identified. That's how she's doing it. And if she pulls up this list and it says, sorry, no results. Then she says, Ginger doesn't have any ICAP students. She goes for a visit. Ginger says, oh, we ran three ICAPs this year. We have 30 students. Not in DAISY. We got to figure out how to get these students identified in, in DAISY and registered in DAISY. And again, it could be as simple as clicking that button and saving it in the student status. So that's where we're trying to help you guys know what you're looking for. And, and help make sure everybody's looking the same way. So that's where you look for, is anybody missing? Okay, so next steps. We're at the end, we got time for questions. We got 15 minutes if you want, or we could be done slightly early, but next steps. So go back to your program and check your data. Share these slides if it's not, if like I don't know that Michelle is really the data person at JJC. But she can share these slides with whoever it is so they can go through and check it and make sure everything's in there like it's supposed to be. Remember to input your data and update your data. Because again, if even if they're in there marked as ICAPs, but you don't go back in and mark them as completed, we can't count them as completed because they're not marked as completed. So that's where this update piece comes in. Fix errors so everyone can count where they should. If a student doesn't have a pretest, that's going to throw an error status, and it doesn't matter what other data is in there, they're not going to count. If they've got attendance is screwed up somehow and they're in an error status, nothing else you do with that student is going to count. As long as that student is an error, they will not count for anything in NRS. So whatever error reports you can errors you can fix, fix them. Um, please do not wait to the last minute to update student information. We've all been there and said, oh, I'll get to it tomorrow. I've got time tomorrow, I'll get to it tomorrow. Then the world falls apart tomorrow and you don't get to it and you completely forget that you haven't gotten to it. And then you get to the end of the year and you don't have anybody to report. So try to try to get that done on a timely basis if you can. I mean, obviously you have to wait till the student completes. You can't, we don't want you to go in, you know, they start August 15th. We don't want you to go in August 20th and tell me they completed in December. Wait till December to tell me they completed, but tell me that they completed. Markham is completed. Um, when looking to add a bridge or an ICAPS program, if you've got something that you're like, ooh, maybe I want to try that. Maybe I want to explore that bridge or I want to look at that ICAPS. You can go look at that um, ICAPS Illinois webpage to see, I totally missed, left out a word, see who ran what in FY23 to get some ideas and possible resources to talk to. Um, and then make sure that you include what you have offered in bridges and ICAPs on your next quarterly report. Reminder, they're due 1031, 2023. Um, that was not, that Kathy did not ask me to put that on there, but I'll put it on there anyway. Um, so again, for some of you that are talking about running ICAPs in different years, you're also going to be reporting it on your quarterly report that, hey, we ran this ICAPs at this point. 
So Michelle's going to say, we ran an ICAPS that went from January through June. Should be reporting it in quarter three and quarter four. So then Rupa's going to look at that report and go, oh, good, they've got a report. She goes in, she checks, yep, they've got students. There are, yes, we're good. Okay, so that we're checking this multiple ways. Yes, Michelle. Um, so if you, I looked on the list and it has the, the current for 23 um, ICAPS that are running. I noticed there, I think there was like a history of ICAPS on the left. Is that for all ICAPS that ran in other fiscal years? So let's say you want to pick the brain of somebody else or. The history is the history of ICAPS as a whole. Like oh. it takes you back to where ICAPS started. Uh huh. And like walking through, working with Washington State with the IBEST model and accelerating opportunities and that sort of thing. So that's more the history of ICAPS okay. as but a whole, not programmatic history. Okay. So, but if you're looking programmatically, it's like, mm -hmm. for instance, we've done manufacturing and IT in the past. We just don't have the funding to run all of, of, sure. of those at the same time. Um, is there a place to go and look where everybody's offered ICAPs in different fiscal years. So let's say we want to mentor or, or ask people, oh, how did that go for you? I don't know that we have that list of offered programs, which is why we started that survey last year and it got added to quarterly reports this year. Because oftentimes Kathy would say to me, Angela, how many ICAPs do we have in the state? And my answer was, how many do we have approved or how many are running? Because just like you said, I know JJC has manufacturing and IT approved, but you haven't been running them for a variety of reasons, which is totally fine. So it's like those numbers, those aren't the same numbers. And so we were like, okay, how do we find out what's actually running? And so that's where we did the survey and then we've moved to quarterly reports. So at this point, um, you might be able to reach out to Sarah or Tara or I and say, hey, I'm looking for somebody who's been running a manufacturing for a while and we may just know from conversations in our own history as to who's run that that we may be able to connect you to but there's not a list that you can just click and look at sorry that's okay thank you but we will in 26 and 27 have these lists moving forward because now we're tracking it go us Okay, I just wanted to say one more thing, um, and that is for all the programs uh, that classes or ICAPS bridges uh, should always be reported within a fiscal year in which they end. Um, and that they should be reported in one fiscal year only to prevent duplications and plus so that you can get a credit for it once they complete. So, because I think a lot of programs, even I think earlier somebody said that what if a a course is starting in the month of March and ends in August, you know, but that's up to you to also maybe, you know, plan it and decide what needs to be done so that you can get a credit for that. And then it's NRS reportable as well. So yeah, if that makes sense. There's, there's lots of like nuances yeah. To all of this with ICAPs individually, with mm -hmm. DAISY, with running it, with what counts, how does it yeah. count, where does it count, when does it count? Yeah. There's lots of those parts and pieces, which is part of the reason we do the transitions to help you guys. And this is my that answer stuff. from a DAISY perspective, you know, and a DAISY person. This is how it helps because it's, you know, if you're not reporting it within a fiscal year, it's just, you know, you're not getting credit for it. And you're putting in all that effort for pretty much nothing. So yeah, it is encouraged to start a course or a class within a fiscal year so that you get credit for it and it's NRS reportable. Because once, uh, you know, DAISY is locked, the data is locked, they can't add anything to it, you know? So yeah. Other questions? Again, raise your hand. And Michelle, do not feel bad about asking questions because you're probably asking a question that somebody else in the room also has. Yeah, so. we need to clap for Michelle for all the awesome questions <laughs> she asked today. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm very clueless. So <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. No, I, I, those are amazing questions. <clears throat> yeah. 